Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining the, uh, the webinar. Um, so I, I, I first off want to welcome you and uh, introduce the first um, new, new type of webinar. So, uh, you know, we, for, for several years, our studio has been doing um, our studio uh, series of webinars where primarily someone from our studio talks about um, one of our products or uh, a new, new interesting idea. Um, with this, we're starting um, kind of a subset of these webinar series, um, kind of a, our studio community uh, webinar series, where we talk to people outside of our studio who work with R and data science uh, and you know various technologies that that, that are helpful in our work. Um, with this uh, series, uh, you know we're getting started with what we call the Shiny Developer Series. Um, in, the, in the Shiny Developer Series, um, we'll be uh, you know discussing kind of issues related to working with Shiny, um, uh, our, our, and our host will talk a bit more about that. Um, so. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our host, um, Eric Nance. Uh, he's a statistician in the life sciences industry um, and host of the popular podcast, uh, The Art Podcast. And I'll hand things over to you. Great. Well, again, Curtis, I am uh, super excited for this opportunity and this uh, series of webinars. And first, I want to thank you, Curtis, for being so helpful and helping um, come up with this uh, excellent idea with me and, and being at the front line of helping organize a lot of great great panelists that we'll have in the future sessions. Um, so, yeah, our pleasure. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, Curtis uh, mentioned some of the motivations at a high level, but um, I've launched the Shiny Developer Series as a way to showcase what I feel is one of the more innovative and rapidly growing uh, ecosystems within R right around the Shiny package, of course. And so many in the Shiny community, whether they're package authors or application developers, have done lots of terrific, uh, 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 created a lot of terrific applications of awesome ideas. And my hope is through this series, we can spotlight a lot of those efforts. And in terms of formally kicking off this endeavor, I thought it would be a great opportunity um, to, to hear from the inside of Shiny, so to speak. So our first ever guest on this series of webinars is our studio software engineer, Winston Chang. And uh, Winston, can you uh, confirm that you are online? Um, I am here, are you able to hear me? Yes, very well, yep, thank you so much. Um, so Winston is, as I mentioned, a software engineer at our studio and he's actually been involved with Shiny development and the Shiny team for uh, quite a number of years. So it's really awesome to get his perspective as, as we go forward here. Um, the way I wanted to lead off this, um, the, the questions I have for Winston is to talk a little bit about the backstory of Shiny in terms of some recent efforts that the team has done um, in the last couple of years. Whereas early adopters of Shiny, such as myself and many others, um, were getting to know the technology, maybe creating these rather simple applications and getting a feel for how everything works. And as we became very enthusiastic with the technology and what Shiny could offer, um, we wanted to start trying to make these tools for production usage. And within the last couple of years, um, Winston, you and the Shiny team have done some awesome uh, contributions to Shiny itself and tooling around Shiny so that we could build these very uh, complicated workflows for a production usage. So maybe you could talk to us uh, to kick this off, if you could talk to us a bit about the journey from the Shiny development perspective to making this happen of going to this more production-like workflow. Yeah, um, sure. So let's see, way back in the beginning of Shiny, um, well, I, shouldn't, I, I wasn't there for the very beginning. I was not part of our studio yet, but uh, that was, uh, Shiny was, uh, Joe Cheng's uh, brainchild, and I believe that was in the summer of 2012. He came up with the initial implementation in the in a few months, which is uh, incredible. Um, and I joined our studio, uh, yeah, after after Shiny had existed for a couple months, and uh, I started uh, doing some work on it. Uh, and uh, over time, I ended up doing more and more work on Shiny. Um, yeah, and you know, in the beginning, uh, I think there was the vision that it would turn into, um, you know, a, a, a tool for production. But um, we started off by 
by having people use it in educational settings for teaching, uh, for teaching, and for you know little demonstration applications. Um, over time, uh, you know, we were able to get, we were able to uh, make it more robust and add more features that people needed for production usage, and we went through some, uh, we went through some, some growing pains along the way. <clears throat> I remember one of our, yeah, one of the early experiences that we had with this was, um, so, so it, in the beginning, we we had we maintained um, two servers that we uh, that we were running on Amazon AWS, and uh, that were running Shiny Server, and we just allowed people to put whatever applications they wanted on there. So it was a very you know it was a very simple system back then, and uh, and we maintained it manually, which is you know we're we're well beyond that now. But uh, yeah, so we maintained it manually, and um, one of the applications uh, blew up on social media. It was the I believe it was the like the language dialect map yes I, I remember this i was very that? fascinated by that growth right <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that was i mean that was so that was uh um that application was written by uh, josh katz who uh then he he was a phd student in linguistics and i think he, he ended up he he later after he finished he went to the new york times but um and he actually published a book about this so you'd answer some questions about like you know how do you say you know, the A and bagel and, you know, so things like that, uh, a bunch of questions. And then it would try to pinpoint you um, for, or where you grew up based on, um, based on the way that, uh, that you, that you say certain words. And it was, it was really cool, but it became very, very popular. And we had tons of traffic and we had to spin up, you know, multiple servers on AWS. And again, this is back, we were doing this all by hand back then. So it was, um, we were, we were, you know, we were working late and we were up at late at night and starting up these servers and you know copying files over and um, monitoring the traffic. So that was you know that was one of our first encounters with like a like heavy heavy load on a, a shiny application. So anyway, that that those sorts of experiences taught us some good lessons. And uh, um, so that helped us that informed us that helped us learn what we needed to do to you know provide production ready deployment systems. So now this stuff is not, these uh, these serving platforms are not stuff that I personally have done much or any work on, like, uh, you know, Shiny Server, Shiny Server Pro, um, our Studio Connect, and uh, and also shinyapps.io, which is our cloud-based hosting platform for Shiny applications. So these are not things that I personally have done work on, but, um, but yeah, we learned a lot of lessons in, you know, how to scale things, how to make things, um, reliable, how to have deployments that, you know, where the packages um, and the version of R are locked to whatever version you were using in development. So that, you know, made things more predictable so that, you know, you, you didn't have a different version of a package running on your server that you did locally and that which would cause breakage. So there's all sorts of things like that, that, um, that we learned through these experiences. Um, and so at the same time that you know those those things were getting developed. Uh, those products were being developed. We also so in Shiny itself, which is where I've you know where I've been working, um, we've made improvements to you know make the UI uh, more flexible, um, and uh, yeah, making the UI more flexible. Um, and also, in the last couple of years, as you noticed, we spent we put a lot of effort into making Shiny more uh, ready for production. So, um, and I, Eric, I know that you've you've been involved in using a lot of these things because you've given us a lot of feedback. Uh, but like things like doing like automated testing with Shiny Test. Um, recently, we put out uh, a load testing package called Shiny Load Test. Um, we've worked on uh, improving the speed of uh, serving up files. Actually, I should mention right now, uh, we just published on the R Studio blog um, an announcement of Shiny 1.3.2. Um, yes, so congratulations a, to you thanks. and the team. That's exciting. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, so, you know, the, one of the um, one of the big features there was um, serving of files on a separate thread. So that's so that's that is that can result in dramatically improved performance for heavily loaded applications. Um, and um, 
yeah, so we've yeah, so that's that's where we've been putting a lot of effort in the last couple of years, um, and as and we've wrapped up some of those projects. So um, yeah, so so now we're well, we're focusing on some other some other things right now. So um, did you have any other specific uh, comments or questions about the things that I've that I mentioned just now? Oh, those that's been a great summary, and and frankly, I just wanted to make sure the audience is aware of the investment that you and the team have made on these points. Where I think, like I mentioned in the early days, we were kind of um, sometimes bumbling through these ideas and doing these kind of testings more manually, just trying to get a bunch of users to kind of hit it at once in more of an ad hoc fashion. But now with these with this tooling in place, I think it puts development of shiny and, and like I said these more production complex workflows on equal footing in terms of the the development mindset as you might see in other traditional software engineering ideas um, and that kind of is a bit of a segue to my next major theme I wanted to talk about is that as I, as I mentioned in the outset I started very simple apps they were to demonstrate maybe a plot or demonstrate a table you could download as an Excel spreadsheet of all things, you know, little little things like that, utility apps, I would call it. But as I started being in situations where now I had to put a front end to a complex pipeline of analyses, whether it's importing data, getting to know your data better via explorations and interactive visualizations, and then actually performing analyses on a high performance computing cluster, and then be able to bring all those results back in real time. Um, without a lot of friction for the user. That required for me a much different mindset than what I was used to as just a regular R user to just use things like the typical tidyverse packages or even the old days, the other base R utilities. I had not had that, that um, opportunity to think of these more complex applications that R was a, as a backbone of. So my question to you is, um, I th from my perspective, I think when you develop Shiny apps to a, a larger scale, it requires a slightly different perspective and a slightly different set of principles than maybe the typical R user is uh, accustomed to. So maybe you give us your thoughts on, um, from a developer standpoint, on what those principles could be useful there. Yeah, um, sure. So I should I should preface my answer to this uh, by saying that I personally don't actually do much large-scale uh, shiny application development um, I see things that that people are doing with it and I always think it's really cool but uh, most of my experience with this with actually developing large-scale shiny applications is uh, is, is secondhand um, because I'm you know so I learned from you know I talk to people and um, and and as uh, and you know as a, as a group the shiny team we learn about things that people want and the things that they're trying to do and we try and we we try to make it easier for them uh, and we try to make things easier and more reliable. Um, so that's that's my experience doing these things. But um, you know, in in general, I think that there's a lot of people that start writing shiny applications, um, and and they're just they're regular R users, right? So their background is in statistics, uh, data science, um, and and they start writing shiny applications because they can they can you know it's it's to be able to turn your, um, you know, your your R data analysis and this this interactive web app that other people can use, that's 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 incredibly powerful, um, and so it's there's I think for a lot of people that has a lot of appeal. But um, as you're saying, like when they when they start making bigger and bigger apps, they start running into these these problems. Like how do you manage complexity? Um, how do you um, how do you how do I keep it straight? Like, what's you know, what part is being used by uh, other parts of software? Uh, how do I write this software? How do I write my application so that uh, other people can maintain it? So you know, that like it's not I'm not the only person that can do it. And um, these are, I think these are like, it's like typical software engineering problems, right? Like, uh, um, so so a lot of people they they start doing this data analysis, but then they, they, it turns out like once they start making bigger and bigger applications, they have to learn how to be, do software engineering. Um, and so those same, you know, the same principles that people use in software engineering are important for, uh, for developing large scale shiny applications. And these, you know, these things can include, you know, include like 
try not to repeat your code. Um, try to try to keep your code modular so that um, you know one part interfaces with another part of code only through you know through clear and obvious uh, interfaces. Don't like just grab. Don't set global variables to try to communicate information. Yes, uh, actually, I'll just mention that I've learned those lessons the hard way, and I've been <laughs> trying to be vocal about that in some of my recent presentations. But if you can master things like modules and be able to factor out different pieces of your application's processing into separate functions, your life will be a ton easier, not just in the present, but future year as well. So yeah. every time you mention modules, that, that triggers <laughs> me to make sure people yeah, are aware sure. of that. Use those tools that they're there. So yeah. Yeah, and I'm, you know, and yeah, and, and sorry, when I mentioned modules just now, I meant modules in terms of like shiny modules, which is a specific thing, and uh, sort of modularity of software in general, which is, yes. um, you know, keeping parts isolated and self-contained and uh, um, and not messing with other parts of the, the code. Um, but, you know, if you're able to do these things, like if you're able to learn these things, I think that's really, um, uh, and that means that you'll be able to develop larger shiny applications, which I think is it's it's really it's really powerful because um, you know if the if you're the data scientist and you're able to create this web application, you're able to like you if you understand uh, the domain that you're working on, um, I mean into the domain of the data, like the topic that you're 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 trying to work through, and you're able to create this web application that's that's all contained in one person's head, that makes it um, a lot a much faster process to be able to iterate through uh, different i try out different ideas, uh, try different ways of looking at your data, try give you know give different um, controls in the application to you know to slice up the data and and and, uh, and just and, and investigate it. Um, whereas if you don't learn these, uh, if you don't learn how to do the software engineering principles and then you get to your application gets to a certain size and then you decide, okay, well, you know, we've got this data scientist here and then we're going to have like the web developer or the, yeah, the web developer over here and they're going to talk to each other and try to develop something. Um, then, you know, that has its benefits, like, uh, that has its benefits of course, but the drawback is that you, you don't, um, like there's this talking back and forth. You can't just like try out different ideas uh, just sitting at your R console. You have to um, talk to somebody and convince them that they want to work on this now, and that becomes a, there's a much longer feedback loop. So, um, you know, so so that can that can slow down things, and that can make it harder to to create ways of exploring your data that way that you want to. Um, so. Yeah. So in short, yeah, learn how to do software engineering. I, I <laughs> uh, uh, so um, yeah, by having modular code, uh, by uh, uh, and and by keeping in mind that you know writing software isn't it's not just about getting your computer to do, to do something. It's about it's also this uh, you're writing the software also for yourself and for other people. So that's really important. Uh, to not just to use, but to be able to to, to uh, work with your software later. It's different from writing like a one-off sort of analysis script where you just you, know, you can take all sorts of shortcuts and you know just get it done. And who cares how ugly the code is? Uh, when you're when you're working on anything that's larger scale, you have to be more careful about it. But it but it pays off in the long in the long term. Absolutely, I, I completely agree. And I've been on both ends of the spectrum. My journey was to kind of hack some together in the very beginning and not think about future me or future whoever maintains that in the future. And they, some of those things would, would in essence kind of taper off and nobody would use them anymore. Or when someone tried to use it, they would crash. I just been through an experience where I'm resurrecting an application that worked well on one infrastructure. And then for about a few years, it's been dormant and I'm bringing it back but past me did not do the things that you just said and I'm yeah. <laughs> refactoring quite a bit for it but now as I go forward I am trying to adhere to these uh, like you said it's a software engineering mindset and the part that I, I think is related to your advice is you, nobody that develops shiny apps needs to be scared of these ideas I think once you go through it once and I do mentioned that you almost have to go through this once yourself to kind of see each side of that of that spectrum oh, yeah, definitely but once you do 
you'll you'll thank yourself later and then you'll have ideas that you can transfer from one project or one application to another but i think putting putting things out there trying things out and being upfront that maybe one section is more of a prototype and one section you're trying to do in a more robust way i think learning by doing is the best way of learning shiny um, and and to be another point i want to make is for this particular series that we've been embarking on i want to make sure that what we talk about through panelists such as yourself and through the demonstrations that i plan on doing in the off webinar episodes that we are showing these ideas of going to a more complex workflow but in a hopefully an easy to digest fashion so that you can take those ideas and use them in your project. So obviously stay tuned for future content on that, but I think that's been an audience that we haven't talked to enough in some of the recent uh, resources that have been put out there. So definitely it's great that we have you on to, to kick off that, that mindset that we'll try to um, make more apparent and clear in the, in the later episodes. Um, so I, I think the other point I want to touch on is we've talked about now the, the past and that journey to the production and then some of these design ideas and the mindset that can help you make an effective application. But from my perspective, it looks like the future is very bright for where Shiny is going. So I wonder if you could take a few minutes to touch on not just what's been coming out in the recent release today, what are some of the bigger items that you and the Shiny team are thinking about to uh, integrate and make Shiny even better than it is today. Sure. Um, yeah. So you know, as as we talked about the the our, our main focus um, for Shiny uh, in the last couple of years has been to uh, it has been for production, uh, make it more production ready. So performance, reliability, testing, those sorts of things. Uh, and we're sort of uh, I think we're sort of like coming out of that now and right now um, we are working on UI improvements so um, so we have we're working on I, I shouldn't I shouldn't say like reimagining the UI but we're revamping the user interface um, and uh, we have uh, we're also working on uh, providing a lot of examples and documentation about how to so so uh, currently the documentation uh, and the examples many of them are, are like you know here's radio buttons here's how you use them you know or you know here is a file input here, you know and then there's an example that has a file input and that's it's sort of like you know how do you hear or here's how to use individual components so we're sort of looking at it from like the level of of uh Here's the code that we're supplying you. Here's here's how to use it. But mm -hmm. um, we're trying to look at it again from more from the perspective of um, from the designer's perspective. So uh, we have a designer on the team, uh, Tony Santos, who's been working on thinking about like, well, here's what I want to accomplish, and then how do I do this? So having doc, you know, uh, having some documentation with visual examples and do's and don'ts of um, of of how to how to you know provide controls for your uh, uh, for filtering your data um, and and that sort of thing. So he, you know he's he, he's coming at it from a designer's perspective, which I think is really helpful for for us because um, you know most of us that have been working on Shiny, we're coming at it from a uh, software developer's perspective, which is sort of looking you know starting from um, from the code up. So uh, so that's one thing we're working on. Um, we're also working on um, redoing or updating the uh, uh, the web library that we build on from. So currently we use something called uh, Bootstrap. We're using Bootstrap version three, and we are in the process of updating to Bootstrap four. So that will, which which allows some uh, some layout options that are uh, that Bootstrap three doesn't have. So um, one of the things that we want to do is uh, provide a flex layout. So that is that's actually a, a CSS, a piece of a CSS terminology. But um, if you've ever used Flex Dashboard, that uses CSS Flex. So um, I mean, the, the key thing that that lets you do is to fill vertical space um, to scale it to the height of a window. 
So if you've used uh, Flex Dashboard, that's the uh, uh, with R Markdown, um, it, it does that, and and so we, that's one that's one thing that that we want to be able to let people do to make it easy for them to create uh, create nicer dashboards. Because you know we have the we have if you use just Shiny itself as it is, or if you use uh, the Shiny Dashboard package. Um, so Shiny Dashboard makes, you know, dashboard, it sort of has a dashboard style layout, but you can't fill the vertical space. So each, you know, each box that you have is whatever height it's going to be. And it may or may not fit in the window of the, that the user uh, is using, but, um, uh, but so it doesn't, it doesn't look quite as nice as like a dashboard that would sort of fill, uh, fill the whole window. Um, but yeah, Bootstrap 4 has other components that, that we're lo looking to use, and uh, we, we'd want to make it a little bit easier to do uh, to do theming as well. Although we well, we already have some of that with the Shiny Themes package. Um, so that's that's like the immediate future of uh, well, I shouldn't say immediate, but that's like the sort of the more um, what we're working on this year is is focusing on UI stuff for Shiny. Um, and of course, you know, I, 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 there's all sorts of stuff that's happening on the, the side of, um, on the server side of things. So, like with with R Studio Connect, but I, I don't feel like I'm qualified to say much about uh, what what's happening with Connect. So that's, uh, uh, so I won't I won't go into that. But that's you know that's that's for, I think I think. Curtis might have something some know more about that than I do actually. So he may mention that a little bit later. Sure. Um, one thing that I was thinking about too, as you were talking about the the migration or, or the capability of incorporating Bootstrap 4, is um, how do you ensure that those that have apps in production that are using, of course, the traditional shiny Bootstrap 3 layout, what are the things you're thinking about to make that a smooth transition to the newer oh, UI yeah. framework? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, I threw you a curveball there. <laughs> no, no. This is that's actually that's a really good. Uh, so you know we haven't decided for sure yet, but um, one option, like I think the the safest option would be to just keep using Bootstrap three by default in Shiny, and then just have a separate package like, you know, for that people, you know, so at the at their in their app they do library Shiny and then Shiny or library BS four or something like that, um, and then and then they get the Bootstrap four components, and and the functions may have separate names. Um, so, so any any existing code will keep using Bootstrap three because it is, um, it is as you said, like it's it's, it would be dangerous to like just replace it in people's applications. We actually did that at one point in the past when we moved from Bootstrap two to Bootstrap three. Oh, um, interesting. We did, yeah. There was actually, a, um, and then there's a shiny Bootstrap two package actually that you can. It's still it's still on Cran where you can. Um, which you can use to to run your app with Bootstrap too, um, but it wasn't it wasn't perfect. And and at the time, you know, Shiny was still relatively new at the time. There weren't a whole lot of people using it in production, so we were it was more we were more able to make those sorts of changes back then. Um, doing it now would be, you know, I, I it would break people's applications. I think people some you know people if people are using custom CSS or um, custom JavaScript that relies on Bootstrap too. Then you know we don't want their applications to break just because they upgraded Shiny. Um, so yeah, so yeah. Now that I'm talking about it more, like <laughs> having a separate package is sounding like a uh, a better and better idea. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, the point well taken, and the fact, and one of the reasons I'm so enthusiastic about Shiny is the fact that um, there is such an awesome ecosystem around Shiny in terms of other packages. I mean, of course, some are from you at our studio, but a lot of others are from whether just application developers or they're from other organizations. And we're seeing ways of plugging in, um, such as HTML widgets is a classic example from a year or two ago, where now we can plug in the DT, you know, for tables or leaflet for maps. I mean, there's all sorts of awesome um, utilities we can plug in too. And then one that I saw um, got released recently is the way of implementing React JavaScript utilities as well. So I don't know if you want to mention that. Oh yeah, one, but... yeah. So that's something that uh, 
that uh, uh, Alan Dipert, who's on the Shiny team here at our studio, and Kent Russell, who is um, uh, not, he's he does something else which I actually don't know the details of, but um, that they worked on together this package called React R, which provides um, uh, makes it easy to use React components. So React is uh, this is separate from Shiny's reactivity. React is a JavaScript library uh, that's that Facebook uh, has written and has, has open sourced. Uh, and there's it's uh, there's a lot of cool components that are built on React out there. Some got cool JavaScript components. So um, so the React R package makes it easy to connect those uh, those existing React components to to Shiny. Um, and yeah, so you know the goal is to of of React R in particular is to make it is to open up that that world to Shiny developers. So you know I wouldn't obviously I wouldn't expect most Shiny users to create React um, create bindings to React libraries, but hopefully you know hopefully with React R it's simple enough that people who are maybe Advanced users of Shiny would be able to create uh, create bindings to them, and then for you know, for example, um, uh, Alan is working for I think uh, for at least for a demonstration, he's he's creating a uh, React color picker package, which it just uses um, it uses this React color picker and it provides bindings to to Shiny, um, and it's it's very simple. Like if once you use the React R package to to connect these things together, so hopefully. You know, hopefully other people will start doing that as well and then there'll be there's there's a whole there's a whole world of things out there that people will be able to um, connect to shiny using react r yeah i think these efforts are hugely important especially for those of us that are coming from traditionally the r side of programming i mean in my much earlier days i won't say how many years ago but i, I helped even to develop php applications and things like that but i was not intuitive in the least but the way that react r and like i said html widgets um that you can you have your way of almost picking off these utilities off a of shelf at a store and just be able to plug them into your apps with minimal friction usually and then i think the art is how do you kind of combine those in a cohesive framework and I mean, I've mentioned this a bit on my little episode zero released a week and a half ago, but I think uh, for someone who wants to get inspiration, what you can do with all these things kind of network together, please check out the shiny contest submissions that were submitted for the, the recent shiny contest. I know me personally, I've gotten about 10 or 20 great ideas just for seeing whatever people submitted. Yeah, those um, are super it, cool. Yeah, they're, they're really, you know, innovative ideas and things that I thought simply were not possible, but I think it gets to the point of Shiny itself has this kind of foundational platform. It's what you put on top of it and how do you integrate with other um, frameworks that can take whatever you're working on to another level entirely. So I'm really encouraged to see that both Shiny itself has a lot of awesome ideas going forward, but then there's also these kind of ecosystems and what I'll put in quotes a shiny verse that are that are coming to play. So it's really encouraging to see that lots of awesome developments there. Um, so yeah, so yeah th this has been this has been awesome to, to talk about this and I can certainly talk about it all day because I'm a shiny sure, addict. Yeah. Um, but um, I'll I'll kind of give this opportunity for those that are listening to the webinar um, to maybe ask us some questions and we'd be happy to help answer any. Um, so I don't know if Curtis if you have ones that you've been flagging along the way or I haven't seen any come through my way. I don't know if Winston, you've seen any. No, I don't. I don't see any questions. Okay, because I, I, I definitely I have, the right have system to see it. Okay, because I definitely have. <laughs> I have other things I can ask because I'm like I said, I'm addicted to this stuff. But um, uh, yeah, well, as long as we're you know you, me, if you <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so I'll, I'll start off. Um, one thing we didn't really touch on yet is the fact that. As you get into this software engineering mindset, you have this opportunity of using a lot of what is generally termed as dependencies in your project or application. Um, now, for me personally, I tend to use quite a bit of packages in my Shiny apps. I, my biggest one uses upwards of 40 or 50 packages, which wow. on the surface sounds almost frightening, 
but at the same time, they all work together to bring this kind of cohesive story. But I guess from your perspective, again, from the development side, what are some of the issues that we should consider as we start building these applications that don't just depend on Shiny itself, but also depend on many of these additional packages for even additional custom code via JavaScript or other um, outside of Shiny or outside of our utilities? I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I'm, so I'm curious just uh, for your particular application, or is it, are most of those packages like Shiny related or is it other stuff like our, just our stuff like, you know, deep fire? Um, for, the, for the one I'm thinking of, it's definitely a, a mix. I would say about maybe 40, 50% are Shiny related packages and the others are just, you know, our Tidyverse or HPC or other, other statistical packages. Okay. Yeah, you know, um, I would say it depends. Um, actually, uh, Jim Hester, who's also a software engineer at our studio who works on Tidyverse stuff, he uh, he gave a talk called It Depends, um, which is, you know, it, it, it talks about the same topic, which is that, um, uh, well, I forget the details of what he was saying, but I'll, I'll put my, my spin on this answer. Um, so uh, whenever you're using an, another software package um, or when you're bringing in a package, uh, it, it increases the capabilities for, of, of, you know, of what's available to you. Um, and, and, but of course there's always risks like those. So, so, it, you know, if you're doing a one-off analysis and you're just doing it once, you don't have to worry about these things. But, you know, as we're talking about, if you want to be able to maintain your software, when you bring in these dependencies, um, it's possible that in the future, they might change in a way that will cause your application to break or behave differently or something. Um, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <A few times. laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's a hard question to answer, you know, to give a succinct answer to, but, um, I think generally speaking, you know, it, if um, if you know the provenance of your package, if you know who's like maintaining it, and um, and and you know that this per, like this person or this organization is has a, a good track record of of maintaining packages and not changing them and breaking things, then that's you know that that makes it easier to to take a dependency on 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 this package. Um, um, now, but that, you know, that said, of course, I, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. This is what I work on all day. So I, I know, you know, I, I know, I know, I know a lot of the people that do these things and who are, who are like sort of, um, well-known members of the art community. Um, so I, I so for me, I, I have probably have a better knowledge of this than, you know, than most people out there. So, um, so that can be, that can be hard for people to, to gauge just by sort of, just for just by looking at you know the author of a package, um, but there are some other strategies like uh, like uh, for your for your application, right? I mean, do you do you use some sort of like version management stuff for it? So I, I definitely use Packrat, um, and I'm also prototyping the newer effort called RN for for Shiny apps. That's a huge help to manage the, the actual versions of packages, and of course everything is under Git for version control. Okay, yeah. So that's 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 another that's another solution is to use uh to use Packrat or or uh, RN for some other some other version management system, um, where where it'll just like lock certain your application to use certain versions of packages. So um, so then you know in the future like it's not it's not going to change uh, how it behaves. But of course you know there's um, there's pros and cons of that as well. So you don't get bug fixes. You don't get you don't get whatever updates happen to these packages, um, like per bug fixes or performance improvements or new features or whatever. Um, and then someday you decide, okay, well I want to catch up to all these packages. And then you and then you uh, you do an update and then stuff breaks. Um, <laughs> so um, the, yes, that yeah. has happened uh, more than once in my. Yeah. <laughs> you know, at least the good thing is you get to, you get to control when that happens, right? It doesn't just happen to you. Yep. Yeah, um, that I think exercising that control and knowing when to use it is a it's an art that you have to kind of practice a couple times. Yeah. But 
most yeah. in the R community don't have to worry about that as much. You just low tidy version, they do their interactive analysis and that's it, right? So yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a different mindset when you get the shiny development. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's not just shiny development, but it's, you know, it's sort of like you're, you're putting software in production to just to be used day in and day out. Like that's, that's different from how most, you know, most data scientists work. So it, it requires a little bit of a different mindset. Um, but I, you know, I should also mention that um, uh, that CRAN, the way that CRAN works with package manage, like, or well, well, with total lack of version management, is actually um, can be actually beneficial in some ways. Um, so in a lot of other software ecosystems, like if you use Node and NPM or Ruby um, with Ruby Gems, I believe. Uh, you know, you, the, 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 it's totally normal for people to lock certain versions of their packages uh, to their software project. So, um, so that makes it reliable for that particular project. Um, but then that also gives the developers of those libraries that they're bringing in uh, more freedom to break things um, because they know that, like, well, you should have, you know, you should lock it to a particular version of this package. And if, you know, I change something and, and it broke your thing, well, you should have, you should have just locked it. And then people can go back and do that. Um, but with CRAN, uh, it doesn't. CRAN doesn't not make it easy to install old versions of packages. So sort of the default is just like everything is just whenever you download a package, you're just getting the latest version. So that yes. makes it very hard as a package author uh, to make breaking changes to your package because you know the, that'll CRAN will test your package uh, when it when it uh, comes in when when you submit your package to CRAN, they test your package, but they also test all the packages that depend on your package. So if you make any changes that mess up those packages, um, you have to have a good, really good reason. You have to explain it or, or else, or, you know, you fix it or they'll reject it. So, so that makes it, uh, again, that makes it harder to change, um, change like your, the API of software that you have when you put packages on CRAN and, um, but that again has its benefits. Which is that it's less likely to break. Uh, you're less likely to have your software break when um, uh, when you use a package compared to some other software ecosystems. Yeah, I think that's very helpful information, especially those that are newer to R or maybe they're coming from the more the other frameworks, like you said, maybe Ruby or Python or whatever else. That that package management system for the repositories may be slightly different than how CRAN operates. So it's always good to get to know the system behind the package ecosystem so you can uh, take advantage of that in your in your development yep. yeah yeah well this is like i said this has been a lot of fun to talk with you winston and i'm so excited that we've had a chance to to connect on this and you and i've had a lot of conversations before this on various shiny topics you've also been hugely helpful as i was learning kind of getting back to some of those toolings around production usage uh, shiny test, which um, has been <laughs> such a, 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 I don't know, I want to say lifesaver almost for one of my major applications to automate some very mundane clicking something, taking screenshot, repeat. Like I just could do the yeah, right. thing R script, <laughs> and it was uh, that was it was so helpful. And I could tie it with other things like R Markdown to get an automated report. But just having that capability just saved me so much time. So I hope others in the community are getting similar gains from every all the tooling that you and the team have been creating um, but yeah i just want to take before i wrap up on my end i want to remind others that um, the, there will be a, a thread on the rcu community portal dedicated to this webinar so if you thought about questions that you didn't ask at at the live session feel free to ask them there and i i know myself and curtis and, and winston and others will be checking that regularly and to keep up to date on the rest of the episodes going forward, as I mentioned, uh, please continue watching the community, our studio portal for the announcements on the next webinars, as well as the additional content that I have planned though, that will all be posted on the site. Uh, it's still fairly new, so pardon the dust, but it's a shinydevseries.com and we'll be posting all the archives of these webinars along with other uh, video tutorials there. So. With that, I will turn it back over to Curtis to wrap things up. Yeah, um, thank you, Eric and Winston. Um, and just to note, there were was a couple of questions that came in at the end, uh, and I'll make sure we um, take care of that in the community thread. 
Um, so, you know, th thanks again. This was our first our studio community um, uh, webinar. Uh, so just as a reminder, our studio makes open source and enterprise ready professional software for R. So if you are in an enterprise environment or one in which you find yourself wading through the complexities of working with R or our studio or Shiny, uh, particularly at, at scale or in complex environments, I really encourage you to check out our suite of professional tools as you know, these strive to save you uh, and your organization time and money uh, working with those tools. Um, and you know, uh, a note on uh, the R Studio community webinar series, uh, right, is uh, focusing on uh, kind of the vast ecosystem of developers and data scientists outside of R. And so we're super happy to be working with uh, Eric here um, to do the uh, shiny developer dedicated series. Um, so uh, again, we'll have a thread opened on community very soon after this. Uh, this whole uh, webinar was also going to be recorded uh, and be handed off to, to Eric for um, the R podcast and the, his shiny um, dev series website. Um, and we actually scheduled, I think we, we have scheduled already eight or maybe eight or so episodes for the rest of the year. Um, so in, in the next few weeks, we'll have a sign up page on the community website uh, where you could sign up for the whole developer series. Um, and, you know, uh, stay up to date on all, all of these awesome tools along the way. Um, and yep, this is the first of our Shiny Developer Series. So we definitely welcome your feedback. Um, you, if you have feedback on improving things or advice for us, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you could reach out to Eric directly on Twitter. He's at the RCast. Uh, or feel free to reach out to me on uh, uh, the community website. Uh, and our, you know, our email there is community at rstudio.com. Um, so thanks again. We really appreciate this and we'll um, uh, start addressing some of the questions on the community thread. Thanks and uh, have a good one. Bye.